Uh, I've just made your co-host Sam. So pretty much start when you when you can, really, because I think we'll uh, we we'll just get underway. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, All right, so the subject that I'm talking about is called bioinstrumentation. This is a subject that um, has been running for several years now, and um, but I've started taking over the subject. I will take over the subject next year, and we'll be looking at changing the subject to make it a little bit more um, blended, and then we we'll also include some project-based learning into the subject. Um, so the overview of the subject, the subject is basically uh, teaches fundamental theory and design of biomedical instruments. Instruments that are used in the hospitals, instruments that are used um, for wearable devices, um, and any basically any device that interacts with the body that can be used for diagnosis or for treatment of certain medical. You're not um, screen sharing at this point, uh, Sam. Oh, sorry. Right. That's okay. We've got the gist of what you were saying. Right. So this, uh, hopefully you're seeing my screen with yes, the subject yes, overview yeah. on there. Yeah, cool. So this is the subject overview. Basically, we're talking about the fundamental theories of uh, medical device design. The learners in this uh, subject, they're all master's students in their biomedical engineering course. Um, these students, um, this is one of their core subjects that they have to complete in order to um, finish their master's course. So they have had a little bit of design experience, but very, very little. So they only would have done one other subject, which would have been their capstone equivalent um, in their bachelor's when they're in their final year of their bachelor's. Now, there's uh, about five different learning outcomes that have been defined for this but the, most of them can be summarized into these two. One, we want to teach the students how to design, develop, and analyze biomedical measurement equipment and electronics. So even so much as to not just how do you design it, but how do you troubleshoot it, how do you fix it as well. And the second one is to analyze and interpret data that this kind of device would collect. Um, this could vary from um, signals like from a stethoscope, all the way through to signals uh, from from the brain. So there's a lot, a lot of information to cover in a short period of time. So um, traditionally, this ran with one lecture, uh, which is like two hours long. There's a three hour workshop and a three hour tutorial attached to it. Um, what we're doing this next year is going to change that and say, we're going to change the way we teach so that the students are more involved and not as passive as in previous ones. In order to do that, we're going to use a blended model with online lectures as well as in-person tutorials, but having the option of both in-person or online tutorials for students who would prefer to do their tutorials online. Um, and then a project-based workshop where the students actually determine their own projects and take that forward. So this is how I've currently split the subject. I'm looking at um, one online overview lecture, which is just one hour. It gives an overview of what the students need to learn in order to get through to the next stage, which is their discussion. So they're assigned about a two hour reading that they need to do. After they've done that reading, they can then go on to do their quiz, which is a formative quiz. Then they come into the discussion. And during the discussion, We'll discuss what uh, answers were wrong and what answers were uh, correct, and we'll break them up into smaller breakout rooms so they can talk about how they got uh, those who got their answers right can talk about how they got the answers right. So they are, we want to include some peer learning into this discussion session. Then we have a tutorial, um, which is a two-hour tutorial. I'll talk about the tutorial a little bit later. Um, and then the final part is a workshop where they have a one hour in class workshop where we teach them some of the design principles and uh, they can ask questions. And then they have a three hour where they can just do that um, at home whenever they can. And because there's so many different aspects to the subject, we want to bring that all together. And so we're proposing to use Slack as a way of communication across that entire subject so they can talk about the different aspects 
at any time. We really want to encourage that Slack community so they can actually discuss um, where they're going wrong, how they're going wrong, and talk about um, yeah, how they can fix that. Um, so there's a lot of peer learning aspects as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about GitHub and how we use GitHub in the subject. So as I said before, uh, lectures will be online only, um, and it's really only there to give students a, um, an overview of how the subject will run and what they need to learn. Um, the part two of the lecture is one of the biggest, um, most important parts where we want to encourage peer-based learning and center the learning around the student. We want to build those, um, build those social structures that will help them learn better. Um, the online tutorial or in-person tutorial, again, this is one of the things we're changing the way we normally teach. And often we, when we do the teaching, we say, we'll give you a problem, we'll teach you how to solve this problem. Uh, but what we're gonna do here is to start with a very basic problem and get them to then change that problem to suggest their own um, problem. So say, for example, we give them a circuit diagram, which is really simple. Then we ask the students to pose that as a problem in their own terms, change something about that circuit, and let's sit down and analyze the circuit together. Now this will take quite a bit of time, and so it requires a lot of uh, smaller breakout groups where we can do peer learning, um, and it does require the students to engage with it. Without that, uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, the final part is the design workshop, um, and this is completely um, problem based so but they have to actually find their own problem to solve based on all of the things that they've learned and then um, design the solution as well um, during this part actually to um, bring all of these this aspect of workshop together uh, we're going to be using github as the way of using um, for logging their code logging what they're doing at home logging what they're doing uh, within the workshop as well and then because it's also a team, every member of the team can also submit their own comments. Um, and having done all of that, we should be able to look at how much they're interacting and how good their comments are about what, how they've written their code um, and mark them based on that. So the assessments for this um, has written reports, um, workshop records, which is their GitHub um, repositories, as well as there, there'll be an oral exam and the oral exam will be open book. It's really to get the students to go, you can make these designs. So we want you to suggest a design and let's um, we'll ask you questions about what design you've actually come up with. Um, again, it's really focused, putting a lot of emphasis on the students' abilities um, and uh, getting them to um, engage with the content more. So uh, that's the end of the presentation. So um, yeah, open to questions. Okay, well, you're uh, two minutes early, but um, I guess we haven't really had questions within the other presentation, so we probably um, shouldn't, but thank you, Sam. That's awesome. And our next presenter, I'll just make co-host is Caitlin. Awesome, I will set up my slides. Oh, not yet, I'll wait until there we go. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> oh, looking at my thing. All right. Can you guys see? Oh, whoops. I haven't started sharing yet. Screen two. Yep, All right. Can you, yep. you can see it. Thank Are you, you looking at my? Um, is that? Yeah, I think that's working. All right. Perfect. So. All right, so today I'm proposing two large online first year psychology subjects. Um, so these subjects will be uh, equivalent to, but separate from uh, the core face-to-face -face, uh, first year subjects, Mind, Brain and Behaviour 1 and 2. Um, there's links to the handbook here. Um, so these are two of the largest undergraduate psychology subjects at the university with up to 2,000 uh, enrolments, student enrolments per semester. Um, so these subjects are accredited by the Australian Psychological Accreditation Council, um, which was introduced by Chelsea earlier. Um, so this means that they meet the professional standards required for this year level and are a prerequisite to undertake postgraduate studies in clinical psychology. 
Um, so the subjects are designed to uh, introduce students to the um, each of the major psychology disciplines um, and psychological research methods. And so due to the breadth of this content, uh, the learning outcomes of these subjects are really skill focused and are really designed to prepare students to uh, take part in future psychological studies and potentially careers. Um, however, most of these skills are highly transferable to other disciplines. Um, so the online mind, and online mind and Brain and Behaviour 2, 1 and 2, uh, will have identical learning objectives uh, but will be achieved in a wholly online environment and so will be separate from the face-to-face -face subjects. Um, so we actually received a successful learning and teaching initiative to introduce these subjects next year um, as this will allow for more flexible student involvement um, as well as reduce the logistical and timetabling issues that have, are getting worse and worse with this uh, very large face-to-face -face subject. Um, so we're projecting up to uh, 1,000 enrolments per semester, so it will be quite a large uh, online subject. Um, I'll now reflect on, the, uh, uh, on what the learners will bring to this online subject um, or our learner context. Um, so the large student cohort will come from a wide range of disciplines, um, as this subject can be taken in both the arts, biomedicine and science uh, um, bachelors, um, as well as as a breadth subject, um, and it can be taken at any undergraduate year level and even some graduate year levels. Um, and this includes the Graduate Diploma of Psychology, uh, which is designed for uh, graduate students who are returning to study an accredited psychological program, uh, usually with the intention of being a clinical psychologist. Um, so this means that there is a huge variation in learner motivations, academic skills, disciplines, technology and online engagement, life, socioeconomic and cultural experiences, as well as geographical location. Um, so the online nature uh, of this subject uh, means that our learner context will probably further diversify. Um, as it will probably attract more international people, uh, learners, and uh, those who require flexible learning, such as people who are currently employed or parents, uh, etc. Um, so even though our graduate attributes will be quite, um, like the graduate attributes of the cohort will be very diverse, uh, each student will still have those Melbourne uh, graduate attributes in common, which the subject will still seek to uh, develop in our students. Um, so due to the hugely diverse uh, learner context um, and the remote nature of this uh, subject, uh, establishing a, an, an online community of inquiry uh, is really fundamental to this subject design. Um, so this uh, model involves, it was described a bit earlier by Chris, um, but it involves uh, three interdependent factors that come together to form the learner's educational experiences, um, which includes uh, social presence um, or enabling your learners to have a strong online identity and form purposeful academic connections with their peers, uh, cognitive presence uh, or online learning. Um, this is based on Dewey's uh, practical inquiry model which proposes that learning is a cyclic collaborative process that occurs by the presentation of triggering or activating events or learning activities, uh, followed by personal reflection um, and academic discourse and eventually resolution. Um, and this, uh, this theory is also supported by uh, Vygotsky's and uh, Piaget and Dewey's kind of uh, social constructivism and social cultural learning theories. Um, and finally, there's teaching presence. Um, which is how the structure and design of an online course uh, will uh, support uh, that uh, social and cognitive presence uh, or collaborative learning opportunities, uh, which is what I will explore now. Um, so when deciding on which conversation, uh, which, uh, which uh, design framework to use, um, I drew upon uh, this review by Brower and, uh, Bauer and Vlachopoulos, um, as well as the week six uh, presentations. And so after reviewing these frameworks, um, I decided to go with the conversational framework, which was presented by Jeanette in week six. And I felt that this aligned really well with the uh, community of inquiry uh, framework and uh, would promote active student-centered collaborative learning. Um, so this framework proposes that learning is a cyclic process of using concepts and practice uh, to generate articulations and actions that elicit communication from their teachers and peers um, and information from the environment or feedback to modulate these concepts and practices. Um, and this uh, theory is supported by a range of, or this framework is supported by a range of learning theories. Um, and I felt that it would um, 
provide uh, lots of uh, different opportunities for different, this really diverse cohort that we have to engage in learning in different ways. Um, so if we look at the teacher communication cycle, um, this will provide students with opportunities to uh, learn via acquisition um, or inquiry or investigation. The peer communication cycle will allow for students to learn via a discussion. Uh, the teacher practice modelling cycle will allow for students to learn uh, using practice or actions and feedback. Uh, and the peer modelling cycle will allow for students to learn via collaboration. And we thought that that would fit really nicely with this large um, online subject. Um, and there's this really great online uh, learning tool here, uh, uh, which is available for free, which you can use to create um, specific uh, lesson plans using this framework. Um, so to decide, so when uh, looking at designing my ecology of resources for this subject, I actually integrated uh, the uh, Lucan's uh, eco uh, learner-centric ecology of resources with the conversational framework. Um, so I, first of all, I want to just quickly uh, refresh your memory on uh, Vygotsky's uh, zone of proximal development uh, for social, cultural, um, or social constructive, constructivist learning. Um, so this is that students, um, that to achieve the intended or desired learning outcomes, uh, this can be achieved using uh, people who are more knowledgeable uh, than yourself. So this could be academic teachers, or in our case, uh, there will definitely be a lot of peers who are quite advanced and knowledgeable in different areas, whether that be culturally um, or um, with uh, different discipline areas, um, but then also using technology and tools to help people to achieve those desired learning outcomes. Um, and uh, Lucan proposed that there were three uh, zones of uh, learner-centric ecology of resources, which includes the uh, zone of available assistance, which is every resource and technology available, uh, the zone of approximal adjustment, which is a selected uh, subset of uh, technologies, and then there is uh, the zone of approximal development, which is uh, the learning outcomes or potentials. Um, and so when I integrated this into the uh, learning uh, design, into the ecology of resources with the conversational framework, um, I ended up with uh, looking at technologies that would en enable the teacher communication cycle, uh, technologies that would enable the peer communication cycle, uh, technologies that would enable the practice modeling cycle and technologies that will enable the peer modeling cycle, um, as well as the, uh, and this would be again, be student centered on that. Um, so the whole, uh, the whole ecology here, I'll take you down to the ecology that's actually, that I've created for my uh, subject. So the whole ecology is that zone of uh, available assistance. Each individual uh, ecology is that zone of uh, proximal adjustment. And then um, the learning outcomes that are intended for this subject is the zone of approximal development. Now I only have a few minutes, so I'll just quickly run through um, some one learning activity to promote each of these learning uh, cycles. Uh, so the teacher communication cycle, um, uh, which is technologies that can enable this teacher communication cycle in the conversational framework, um, is looking at acquisition inquiry. So we're planning on replacing our didactic uh, lecture, asynchronous lecture recordings with uh, weekly uh, online modules or workbooks, um, which will use uh, create using Canvas quizzes, and I might give you an example of this in the following um, uh, assignment three, um, where you actually can use micro lectures, readings, and intersperse them with quizzes, questions, and opportunities for reflection. Um, in terms of uh, technologies that promote uh, teacher practice and modeling, um, we have uh, created a, a assessment literacy module, which is where uh, students are required to grade a paper um, that's similar to their assignment. Um, and then we've actually uh, had an expert panel of markers grade this assessment and provide feedback. And so students are able to reflect on their own feedback versus and their own mark versus the, um, the expert panels. Um, and we'll then this will- have to uh, leave it there. Thanks, Caitlin. Oh yeah, no worries. Sorry about that. But uh, yeah, it's looking like a great um, design. So we're on to Pauline. So let's see what I can share my screen. Yep, that's, that's working. Cool. Thank you. Um, hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Good. 
Um, so today I will um, I will just um, present the my my subject design and the sub. Uh, so for this um, subject, uh, I am proposing an online a totally online delivery of uh, a second year subject. So EDP is elements of data processing, and traditionally it is a physical um, lecture. Um, so. Okay, so basically, um, ED, uh, elements of data processing is an introduction to data science subject, and it is a second year undergrad uh, worth 12.5 points. Um, so the only thing I've changed, so traditionally it has, a, it has two one hour lecture and one two hour workshops and three assignments. Um, the only thing I've replaced is from the uh, Parkville campus to online. So the idea is that um, uh, within the, the limit amount of result, um, research time, what I can do is to just not changing the scope of the subject and then try and see whether I can uh, you know, improve the subject with an online mode. So the learning outcome of this subject, it, it is a, an introduction to uh, data science. So we, the, the idea is to have uh, to introduce the students with the data pipeline. So students coming from various backgrounds, but an introduction is to give them an overview of what um, the various components of the data pipeline is that, that makes up a, a complete data science project. Um, and what's the relationship and importance of each component in, uh, in, that, in that pipeline. And then the second learning outcome is, is introducing them the, the introductory uh, component uh, introductory concept and skills um, in each component. So, given that it is an introduction subject, so the each component can be studied and you know um, studied further and deeper as they progress their data science study. So the idea is to teach them a fundamental skill where they learn some basics um, uh, skills. At the same time, they are able to critically evaluate. Uh, the effectiveness or, or the effect of the, the choice of their, um, their method. And then the third learning outcome is that students need to be able to communicate their analysis process and uh, their benefit and risk, etc. cetera, um, for, for, a, for a, a project that they undertake. And finally, um, at the end of the subject, we require the student to be able to actually practically produce a you know, undertake and produce a solution for a um, small scale but realistic data science project. Um, and so having this in mind, the framework, just a high level summary of, so thinking about data science is a very new uh, area, new subject. So um, I've, uh, I've decided that um, the, the most effective uh, method, uh, framework to decide the subject is uh, problem-based learning. And given that we are going to do an online, I think in this current situation where every subject is forced to go online, it is actually a very good opportunity for my subject. And the reason is, uh, I find that um, in, in an era where most of the subject is traditionally physical, um, it's hard to actually look deeply into how flipped classroom works and in, in a science domain. So um, I, I now find that flip classroom might be a very good, actually a very good fit to a data science, to, to, to my project. And even if later on we go back to the physical, we are able to go back to the physical campus, um, the, the sort of flip classroom is going to be more or less staying. That's my view. Um, and the related theory is constructionism. Um, so, so uh, that is very much related to the problem-based learning and uh, the, the, uh, throughout this course, a very uh, sort of deep impression I get is the cognitive load. So it kind of gave me a, you know, a, a light bulb moment as why my students are still confused after I've spent so much effort in, in teaching, in preparing the material. So uh, I think um, I, I used to get a comment and maybe I'm improving on it, but the, it is the cognitive load that I have to work on. So I think that will give a major improvement to my subject. Um, so the subject, as, you, as I mentioned, there is lecture, workshop, and assessment. So there is still within this kind of three framework, uh, 
I'm using the flip lectures where uh, we want to use the trunk chunking strategy to actually um, redesign it so that uh, the content delivery is flipped, is actually made in the pre-recorded videos. And then we have a synchronous Zoom lectures. So that gives students still the, the sort of um, control in, in learning, uh, in social presence, in interacting with the class, the lecturer and the, the peer, the students. So out of class, like I said, the learning theory is that um, it's based on the, the two concepts. One is that if we, you know, a flipped classroom gives us a very good concept to separate, you know, what's just content for them to learn on their own and what is a higher level and higher interactivity that we need to discuss and learn in class. So uh, one thing that we need to mention here, it's very important, is the design of the micro video. So rather than a 15 minutes video recording, we will break it down into a logical chunks to ease the, the cognitive, load, cogn cognitive load of the students. Um, so that's what we do in that. Sorry, I haven't updated this slide. So that's, that is the, that, that is, okay. and, and in the synchronous Zoom lectures, what we will do is to, you know, facilitate the students. So let the student drive the inquiry by questioning, by group, group discussion, and also build upon what they've learned in the basic concept. And then, you know, coming to the class, uh, present, help them to build a more complex case studies in class. Um, An online workshop is a problem-based learning, and it also relates to the, um, the cognitive load theory, where uh, in the online mode, so this is the, the module where if we go back to the physical class, we will replace with the physical interactions. But right now, uh, I think uh, we still present students with a, a set of questions to attempt, and depending on student motivation, but uh, we, you know, this is, of course, we try to train the tutor to be able to facilitate these online interactions better and then to encourage student practice on their own. Um, but at the same time, uh, the, I, the design is that we will have the tutor either video recording or demonstrating the, the problem solving and coding in, in an online video so that a student can learn by example. You know, and, and this is probably more important when, when they feel that in this environment, students don't feel that they can go physically to ask a question from someone. So, um, so that's that. And assessment. Uh, so assessment is uh, is where the I think the constructionism can strive, can, can flourish because um, the the uh, so I take Chris's uh, comments about that. It, the, you know, given five hundred students. It's difficult to mark, but we are still going to design as flexible as possible project-based uh, project, uh, group-based project for students to do. And then so with the, the purposely uh, incorporated, um, you know, re real, with real data and then its inherent uh, ambiguity in the problem solving, uh, this, is tr this tr problem base is truly uh, uh, where they can drive their learning. Uh, sorry. I don't know whether I can see whether my time is up. Um, oh, one and a half minutes. One and a half minutes. Okay. So and then um, so so this this um, <laughs> okay. So that that's based. That's a subject um, that uh, project based. And then to to address the learning outcome three, then there's also a presentation where they need to own the project and and to be able to explain to a group of people. So. Uh, the, the highlight is that the student actually produce a, an artifact, which is a solution that they have to so socialize and communicate with other people. Um, so I think I have too much things. So uh, again, the other materials is, is so that we facilitate a diverse uh, background where some students are weaker, some students are stronger. So we will then try and um, fill all the uh, possible gaps by putting uh, a rich set of asynchronous resources, learn, uh, learning resources online. Um, so this is just the mapping, mapping the uh, activities with the learning outcomes. I will just not go through that in detail. So this is my ecology of resources. Uh, so this is uh, sort of revised from my blog. Mm -hmm. 
what happens, so this, because it's a second year student and data science is naturally very interesting because it's a hot area and people love to be able to understand what to do. Um, so the, the, we can go back to this, uh, you can go, go to this diagram on, later on maybe, but the thing is we uh, try to uh, um, incorporate uh, two key elements. One is to have fun. So uh, I've we'll changed have, the, to, have to leave it there, Pauline. Okay. But. Sorry, I haven't. Looking, but, looking really yeah. good. So we're going to, have to move on to, to Leah. I will stop sharing. Hang on. Oh, I don't have to. Okay, we can see your screen, Leah. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, you're a little bit quiet. Oh, okay. Um, just very quickly try to fix that so that this is better um yeah slightly better um we've lost your screen now though yeah uh okay i am going to talk about a single module that i would like to incorporate into my class which is introduction to machine learning and i'll just talk about the single module in the context of the full class um, so first to give a little bit of context introduction to machine learning is a first year postgraduate course it's usually quite large uh, 300 students sometimes up to 500 students um, so it's delivered in kind of lecture style two hours a week of upfront lecturing um, plus workshops and smaller groups where students do pen and paper exercises uh, obviously the lectures and workshops have all been moved to zoom recently um, and there are two projects which are graded and a final exam and this is what the current curriculum looks like roughly so we start out in the beginning of the semester with a refresher on mathematics and some coding then we just go through a sequence of basic machine learning algorithms both in terms of mathematically deriving them and motivating them um, but also in terms of some practical exposure in the workshops and um, we have a small project where students have to implement one of these algorithms and move on to more advanced ones and move on to the second project graded project which is a little bit bigger and more of a kind of machine learning uh, sorry more of a research kind of setup where students get an open-ended problem a data set and should just apply some machine learning to it uh, analyze the results and write a research report and then in the end of the semester, there's a little bit of room left for, for example, industry invited talk to just broaden the picture a little bit. And then there's the exam. Um, and the learning outcomes of this course currently are very much around deriving machine learning algorithms, implementing them, evaluating them in terms of their performance, in terms of their accuracy. It's also about um, identifying which uh, technology to use in the face of a real world problem but what's missing is the other view beyond just pure utility and accuracy namely an ethical view and of thinking about what other implications um, machine learning has on society now that it becomes more and more central and that's exactly what I want to add to this course so with an ethics unit which will span one or two weeks probably one week of this course and my goals here are to raise awareness of these issues rather than having a full-fledged introduction to ethics, which is clearly not feasible. Um, I want to have my students think about evaluation in a more holistic way. So rather than just optimizing performance, also think about other aspects that machine learning algorithms should fulfill. Like they might, they probably should be interpretable, for example, or explainable in the decisions these uh, algorithms make. And I want to encourage critical thinking with all this. Uh, a little bit more detail on my students. Um, the cohort is large, as I already said, it's also quite diverse. So it's a first semester master's subject. Students come in from all sorts of undergraduate courses um, from many, many different countries. So there's a lot of diversity in demographic background, but also academic background. So many different um, 
undergrad courses, as I said, some focusing on math, some focusing on programming. There are also students from completely different fields like economics, some more technically apt, some less so. Um, and I would like to capitalize on this diversity in this ethics model and also um, encourage my students to embrace disagreement. So the questions we're gonna ask, they won't have a clear cut answer. The answer some people might find right based on their background, others might not find right at all. Um, and I would like to, yeah, my students to realize this and embrace it and find it okay. Uh, so let's talk about the what of an ethics module. What will it look like? So I'm planning to dedicate one or perhaps two lectures to it myself and the workshop session. Um, also, we already have a guest lecture in this class and I would like to repurpose it to have the guest lecture um, specifically touch on the ethics um, issue. Then in addition to this lecture, uh, there will be a group project in groups of about five students and each um, project will look at a problem. I'll go into detail about that in a minute and they will prepare a presentation. And then groups will um, do peer reviews of other groups presentations as well. So how do I want to implement it? What is the theoretical motivation behind this? So I will draw on social constructivism as a learning theory. It very well supports group work. It encourages learning in a social context. And as I said, I really want to have students discuss and embrace their perhaps social differences, different backgrounds, exchange their views. And I want this to be collaborative and social and kind of an authentic learning experience. It will all be integrated in a flipped classroom setting. So as of last semester, my whole class is already in a sort of flipped classroom setting. So the lecture will be offline. Group works will also happen offline. But then in the lecture slot, in the online um, synchronous interaction, there will be the presentations and discussions and um, different groups will watch other groups' presentations in Zoom breakout rooms. And in terms of learning theory, this is very much based on problem-based learning. As you will see in a minute, each group will um, get a problem. And I'll give an example. Um, and this, again, very nicely underpins the constructivist learning theory. It encourages deep engagement with a very specific, realistic problem. And it um, encourages reflection and analysis, which is what I would like to see in those presentations. So here's an example project that I would envision. Um, this one is on facial recognition. And I would like uh, each group to engage with this problem on three levels. So first they should understand the task. What is the task? Why is it useful? What are the use cases in the real world? They should also read and understand at least one recent research paper, a technical paper, which proposes a method to solve this problem, a machine learning technique. What data do they use? How do they evaluate their algorithm? And then they should critically, critically analyze um, the outputs or the impacts of these machine learning developments by, for example, reading some um, news media coverage, some critical blogs, human rights groups analyses, and so on, and talk about what can go wrong, what did go wrong, and how was it fixed? Was uh, the algorithm discriminative? Um, did it um, violate privacy? Can there be a dual use case? And so on. Now the del deliverables are twofold. Um, each group will give a 10 minute presentation in a flipped classroom setting in breakout rooms to their peers. Um, this ties to um, learning outcomes such as improving communication skills, teamwork skills, so soft skills, but also engaging in depth um, with a problem, you know, with a real world task. So again, problem-based learning. The second part of the deliverable is a peer review where each group will um, receive reviews or feedback on their presentations from their peers, so from other groups which watch that presentation. Um, and the point here is to again increase the diversity of perspectives and also for each group to learn about one other problem in addition to what they have been working on themselves. Um, here are some more and some more diverse um, line of thoughts, get more feedback and see how other people think. And this peer review process is already incorporated in this class. Um, I said in the very beginning that one um, 
assessment is a larger open-ended project where people write a research report and these are also peer-reviewed um, among the students and over the semesters we got very very positive feedback on this sort of um, assessment or peer feedback so um, I think I would like to expand on that. In terms of ecology of resources, um, Canvas will be our hub. We will use Zoom, um, including breakout rooms uh, for the synchronous interaction parts, uh, obviously email and other communication channels as well. I will encourage to use um, things like GitHub, Google Drive, or perhaps a wiki for group coordination and collecting resources, coordinating with one another. Um, I will also advertise Adobe Spark or Google Slides to um, create engaging and illustrative um, presentations, encourage the use of multimedia in both learning about their problem and also presenting to their peers. And then um, this will be a new module. So collecting feedback will be extremely important and I will use polling software like Poll Everywhere or perhaps Canvas quizzes to do that. Uh, and just to conclude, there are clearly challenges which I don't have time to talk much about. So one big challenge is how to integrate the whole module with the overall class content. Um, I already said the guest lecture could be one way to do this and there are other overlapping parts um, that I have on my list. Another challenge is how to mark this. So it's, I do not think that I want to give marks based on the content, perhaps based on the level of interaction, but certainly for the first round, I probably won't mark this um, module. Instead, I will focus on evaluating myself, how it went and ask the students for their feedback. So there will be general feedback surveys. I also want to ask the students before this module and after this module about their ideas on ethics and privacy and machine learning and do kind of before after analysis, which I then also want to present to the students Right, um, we'll have to, we'll have to stop you there. Oh, yeah. um, That's it anyway. So yeah, but great. Okay, so our next presenter is Jeanette. Yes, we can see your screens. So that's great. Um, we can't hear you though. <laughs> Okay, apologies in advance for any kid noise interruptions. They've just hit their lunch break. No um, so I am um, going to talk about um, converting our music therapy methods to subject, which is a second year, uh, sorry, first year, second semester subject to a fully online. So this subject traditionally um, consists of face-to-face -face whole class demonstrations and role plays um, and discussions, as well as tutorial groups where we break them out to practice and have a go at the techniques that we're um, working on and to get feedback from their peers and from the tutors. Um, the aim of the subject overall is to pre prepare the students for practicing music therapy in a range of different contexts and using a lot of different techniques. So clearly the problem, the first problem in our um, design based research model is that COVID has necessitated a fully online, move to fully online. Um, we have taught this subject in a blended um, module before, but where they're coming for intensive. So this is the first time we've actually had to try um, bringing everything online. And there are several complications because we're having to do live music making over the internet, which isn't ideal. But we managed to stumble through first semester and I've got some good ideas for second semester. The, the intended learning outcomes are that they need to be able to um, master some of these techniques, so creating raps and beats, being able to improvise in particular um, musical frameworks, um, designing in relaxation inductions and being aware of repertoire, um, musical skills and counselling skills as well. Um, the theory that, we're, that I'm focusing on, on is very much um, student-centred, so uh, looking at the the student, the student as the centre of the circle and the environment and the interactions and the engagement around that for, for the students. The, um, it's informed by, so the, the, the plan to move to online is definitely informed by social constructivism and social learning theory. So um, things where we're looking at a collaborative approach to student learning and co-constructing a learning with the student um, body and also the relationships um, that help develop their cognition and learning. 
also in terms of social constructivism, acknowledging the principles where knowledge is constructed through human activity and that people are creating meaning through their interactions with each other. So I'm also drawing on Vygotsky's zone of proximal, proximal, proximal development um, and really trying to scaffold their learning um, with information that we can provide as teachers and tutors and lecturers, but also that they can draw on from each other in terms of peer learning and, and also providing um, some the best options that we can in terms of technology and tools to help scaffold their learning as well. In terms of demographics, we have um, quite a wide variety of students in the Masters of Music Therapy. So people who are coming from re recent music um, bachelor grads, professionals from other health fields, so it could be speech pathologists, OTs, social workers, um, sound technicians, professional musicians, and there's a mix of um, recent graduates and mature age students, and also um, from local, interstate and international. So the class size is around 45. And um, I plan to scaffold the learning when we're moving to online by really trying to work on this um, community, of inquiry, community of inquiry framework where we're looking at um, developing social presence through things like um, having an open discussion board for course related communication and scaffolding their peer interaction to make the online learning um, a bit less isolating um, and also to stimulate some deeper learning. I think this is particularly important, like it's important always, but even more so now in, in the times of COVID where we have more widespread lack of social contact. In terms of teaching presence, um, I'm hoping to um, promote this by having a regular virtual office hours, um, a regular zo live Zoom interactions, short video summaries and explanations each week um, to keep that engagement happening um, because we won't be always having synchronous um, sessions, you'll see in my plan soon. Um, and then supporting the discourse I think is also quite important where um, scaffolding and providing a, a way for students to be able to collaborate and solve problems together and we need to foster this through um, actually giving them activities where they can do that collaboration and promote a sense of purpose. Basically just having a discussion board open isn't going to magically make that collaboration happen and I think there needs to be some scaffolding and some activities that um, to, to, to sort of facilitate that. I'll get that started. So we'll have Canvas discussion blogs on particular topics, um, paired learning tasks, opportunity for peer feedback. I'm keen to try out feedback fruits, but I haven't done it yet. Um, set, um, annotation of set materials. So this is the ecology of resources that I'm looking at um, in terms of the, the subject hub will be using the LMS, obviously. Um, over to the left in the professional tools, we want to be using uh, music-based software and online software if we can, so GarageBand, Soundtrack, BandLab, um, Ultimate Guitar, YouTube. Um, communication um, is sort of fairly standard and some of these online learning tools as well, so Padlet and Perusal and Poll Anywhere and maybe Feedback Fruits if I get adventurous. Um, I'm basing the, um, the design of this module really on the conversational framework, which I did for my previous um, presentation. And this really helps me to focus in why, how I'm using media and why I'm selecting different tools and technology um, to, to match particular types of learning, according to Lorillard's six learning types. Um, I think this framework is really practical because it makes us think not just about what we want to say or what we want to get across, but how the, what the student specifically is doing to, to understand it or to achieve um, the skill. So given um, the A framework, they use a storyboard um, kind of set out. So I've kind of done this similar to the activity I did in my last presentation where I've got the six different learning types across the top here and then a whole lot of planned learner activities um, that I position. We've got, you know, um, reading, obviously, watching the lectures, uh, watching recorded expert interviews, investigating where they need to go online and find things themselves, build playlists, look at tutorials on YouTube so that we're not just uh, spoon feeding them everything. Um, practicing where they have to do peer review, 
of learning tasks, um, actually having a go at multi-track recording and interacting in their live Zoom tutorials, also setting them um, online role play activities that they have to submit for weekly learning tasks. For discussion, we're looking at things using the Zoom breakout group function, which we used a lot in first semester and that worked really well. Topic-based discussion blogs um, and using perusal for annotation of some set articles. Um, collaboration, we want to get them to, doing, to be doing some small group and pairs work um, tasks online. So um, where we can, even using some of the technology that we can um, scaffold with um, Soundtrap and, and Lab paired online tasks and small group projects and then production, give, getting them to um, submit their learning tasks and their assignments that are based, um, that are using some of these technologies. Um, <clears throat> so we're planning to deliver our asynchronous content in chunks and the spending the synchronous time on discussion and student exploration. So the way that we've set out the whole music therapy course now that we've moved online is to have alternating, alternating weeks. So we can't actually really do a flipped classroom because we are um, giving them tasks to do one week. So we can't also give them preparation for the Zoom week in the same week that we're giving them tasks to do. So we've just decided to do it this way and really that when, we, when we're in this synchronous time in class that we can... Um, do some discussion and small group work and actual practical activities in the breakout rooms. So this is an example of some of the things that I've got set on there. So we've got some expert interviews, some resources here that they can click on to read stuff and li links to YouTube and tutorials and things like that. Track where they can go online and do multi-track recording in groups and chat while they're doing it online together. And just a bit of an overview of the actual course structure. I've tried to break down week by week the content that we're doing, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, some of the tools that we'll be using and um, the content that we'll be covering. So hoping to um, also do a mid-semester poll or survey to, to get some happening um, so we don't have to wait till the end of the semester for LMS and I think that's it. These are my, right. these are my references. <clears throat> right on time. Thank you, Jeanette. No problems. So our next presenter is actually Paula and uh, Paula wasn't sure if she could be here. So she's provided a video. Um, so I'll just uh, screen share and show her video. Uh, her video is actually 14 minutes long. So being fair to everyone else, we'll, we'll just pay the first 10. Uh, minutes of it. So let me screen share. So this is Paula's video. Hopefully the sound comes through. There's no sound. Still no sound? Oh, no sound, is it? Oh. Okay. Uh, advanced sharing options. Hmm, you get this problem occasionally with uh, with Zoom where you're trying to play audio from your computer and it doesn't come through. Let me just try again. Still. No. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll just, um, Paula has put the link on here slot there 
Um, so I'll, I'll just leave everyone to watch your presentation in your own time at this point, rather than uh, try to get the sound working, because that can be problematic, which is a bit of a pain. But anyway, that's kind of how it goes. Um, and she's also put the link to her Spark. Yeah, it is at the moment. That's the current thing. So let's move on to Andrea. Um, let me just make you co-host, Andrea. Okay, yes, we can see your, see your screen, fantastic. Okay, uh, yeah, the module I'm going to talk about is collaborative decision-making as part of the major project management uh, program is part of my proposal and under the Master of Construction Management program. So the learning design framework uh, I'm using suggests that uh, because we are professional education, so everything, uh, all the design should start from a solid research base of the industry context, uh, accreditation bodies, professional bodies, stakeholders particularly. So, and from here we define what is the knowledge and skills sets that is needed for the industry to move from current practice to future practice. So from here, we define the learning outcomes and then we design the curriculum, the uh, methods and assessments. So the industry background uh, that this module is concerned is the fragmented practice uh, in construction management, pro uh, construction project delivery. Uh, that means uh, the uh, supplier, uh, the contractors, subcontractors, designers, and facility managers, operators, and in the end, the demolition stage of the project, they are all doing their own bit uh, without uh, really con collaborating with each other. Each one in the marketplace is trying to maximize their uh, profit at the cost of the project life cycle. So there is uh, environmental issues, safety issues, and uh, uh, disputes and uh, project delay over budget, these are all sorts of issues. There are already some collaborative uh, delivery models in the industry, the system, but the key is that we don't have enough individuals to be able to make them work because people are so embedded uh, in the current practice. There is an adversarial culture in, in the industry. So this is uh, why we need to develop this module to particularly give our graduates the uh, uh, capability of uh, do, making collaborative decisions. And so these are the key knowledge and skills uh, and for making collaborative decisions. Uh, first is to work through people and communication, motivating people, engaging people, organizational design, uh, design roles and rules in uh, organization to make it a motivating collaboration and conflict solutions uh, uh, through collaboration uh, and, and reconciling uh, contradictory project goals. For example, safety and productivity used to be uh, contradicting each other. And whether we prioritize this one or that one, now we want them to be able to reconcile these goals through innovation and non-blame approach of uh, problem solving and forgiveness which means the capability of absorbing the consequences of the mistakes made by your collaborators, uh, rather than pointing fingers, which we um, 
are naturally inclined to do. So all, the, all of these coming together is systems thinking. So these are the capabilities to uh, uh, develop through this module. Uh, there are five learning outcomes. The first two are dealing with the old system, the current system. Uh, students should be able to understand uh, why, uh, what is it, why they are there to uh, be able to describe. And the, the learning outcome three and four are uh, dealing with the collaborative practice. Uh, so students uh, will be uh, uh, identifying the mental models uh, for collaborative practice. And finally, uh, more than knowing it and talking about it, students should be able to do, uh, really do uh, the collaboration, uh, collaborative decision making through this learning process. So these are the five learning outcomes. So the learning activities are basically two projects. Project one is dealing with the old system and project two is dealing with the collaborative system. Uh, now, now, finally, there's a, a process requirement that students should be practicing collaborative decision-making while doing these two projects. So the learning theory uh, I'm using is uh, community of practice. Uh, a slight uh, uh, change with this theory is that we need to recognize uh, the community of practice in reality, uh, particularly uh, addressed by this module. The practitioners are uh, not a uniform characteristic. Uh, the majority of the practitioners are the conventional uh, practitioners, they are representing the adversarial culture, the current practice, but there is a, a handful of leading practice. Uh, they are the core of the community of practice. They are doing this collaborative uh, uh, decision making. So we want students to be aware of the current conventional practice, but uh, aiming at uh, the leading practice so that uh, they will be the graduates joining industry and uh, help, uh, uh, facilitating change in the industry. The target learners will uh, skip uh, that is quite uh, simple. That uh, international students, I suppose after the pandemic should be less international students, uh, but Maybe later we'll <laughs> reconfigure that. Um, so the key uh, design of these learning activities is that uh, 100 students, I'm going to divide them into five large groups, 20 in each group. Uh, so students are supposed to struggle after their own organizational structure. So they have to really understand each other understand uh, what is the weakness and strength of uh, each of them. So what kind of roles each one should assume, how they join together so that uh, it uh, make the best collaboration. And I will appoint three industry advisors, uh, uh, sorry, uh, five industry advisors, uh, each for each group. So they are supposed to give students exposure to their community of practice, give students a legitimate peripheral participation to their community of practice. And each of them will be matched by an uh, academic advisor, uh, academic tutor. And the academic tutor is to make sure uh, that uh, all these uh, learning activities uh, with the industry partner is uh, keep kept in on the focus of this particular module. Uh, so the ecology of resources, the knowledge will be given through uh, references, but uh, lectures, short lectures throughout the process 
while students are doing the two projects. So the lecturers will be the resource, uh, resource for students to take from. And tools, uh, particularly I want to give students an analytical tool so that they can uh, discover that uh, this collaborative practice is more economical and more profitable than the traditional uh, practice that uh, each one trying to protect their own profit. And people as resource uh, to uh, this uh, learning process, of course, in this module, the most important uh, people resource is the uh, industry partners. Uh, I would suppose they uh, give students access to their project meetings virtually so that students can observe, understand the complexity of uh, these decisions are made, why the adversary, adversarial decision were made, in what situation. So how uh, they we'll can- We'll have to uh, finish, finish there, Andrea. Situation. Finish, yeah, finish. Thank this you. Is environment. Yeah, this is the last slide. Very good, thank you. Um, so we have our last presenter for today is Brian. Now, Brian, you put yourself down at 2.10, but if you're ready to go, we might as well go straight now. No, that's fine. I just wasn't sure that I'd be able to get you in time. I had moderation stuff I had to do this morning, so. <laughs> yep. Um, all right, so I'll get straight into it. Can I share my screen while that one's still up? Or does somebody else uh, have to stop should, sharing? I think you just take over. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, somebody else has, this will stop. Yep. Okay. That should be fine. Um, okay. Um, yes, it's again. working. Excellent. Okay, cool. First time with Adobe Spark. So we'll see how we go. <laughs> no uh, cool. So the, the, yeah, I'm in the process really, uh, as we speak in the early weeks of, um, presenting this capstone unit. So I'm kind of experimenting as I'm going along with, some of the stuff that we've been doing as I've been doing in some of the other units I teach as well. Um, so capstone is in the context of the university of divinity where I teach. Um, we have to have a capstone unit and it's the final unit that master students will do as part of their course uh, coursework. Um, and what's nice about some of the stuff we've been learning around is, is it's emphasis on peer interdisciplinary kind of work. Um, so yeah, doing theology is the title of the unit uh, as an integrative capstone. So it's a level nine kind of, as I said, and is currently being offered, um, in semester two, 2020. Uh, you can notice even in the description, there's interdisciplinary integrative and a peer engaged process. Um, and try to encourage students to do theology in their own context, um, in terms of asking research questions, uh, and things like that. So it's the application of theological knowledge for engagement in professional practice and learning. In terms of developing a design <clears throat> framework, um, I think I, as we started this unit, one of the ones that gripped me most was the idea of the flipped classroom approach. Um, and, and so I've decided to use that with this unit and amongst other units that I'm doing. And it's actually, in terms of having to do everything online, it's worked out really well. Um, in terms of an approach that I've found quite useful. Um, so some of the research that's kind of informed me, I noticed a lot of others haven't got into this kind of depth, but um, in terms of the research, but, um, you know, just showing that it's, it means well with blended learning with students individually watch lectures uh, in class beforehand uh, and engage in classroom learning activities, interacting with their peers and instructors. Um, I haven't, uh, I'm not so much showing lectures in these units as, as much as getting the students to do the work before and having a kind of discussion based uh, format in our times together. Um, studies have indicated that unstimulating classroom experiences have a critical um, impact, critical creative and complex reasoning skills. And so I think a FIP approach is proving and I think will prove useful. Uh, and there's kind of a lot of research that you can see there that kind of backs that up. Um, and the, the best kind of definition that helped me inform this was what is by Bergman and Sam's, what is traditionally done in class is done at home and what is traditionally done as homework is done in class. Um, studies show that having online teaching uh, is at least as effective as classroom teaching and that there have been positive results for the flip line approach, sorry, flip line 
uh, flipped classroom approach, despite its polarizing effect in um, assessments, which is interesting. Um, so there's four online sessions for this unit um, because a lot of the work is done by the students themselves um, over the semester. Um, and as I said earlier, the intention is not to give students lectures per se, as one of the previous suggestions sometimes for the online uh, space, but for students to have actually done a lot of the reading um, that will help them with kind of framing the methodology of their projects before the class uh, and before the sessions. Um, and so, I mean, already I've had two, ses uh, two sessions, one session, another one tomorrow morning where um, uh, instead of what I would historically do is, you know, kind of a lecture based, this is the methodology, this is what you engage. I've actually given them all the material to read before and we come into the, uh, into the class and go into breakout rooms uh, where students are engaging with the material and the reading uh, together in terms of forming their methodology and things like that. Um, and so specific learning activities for the online sessions will, as I said, be geared towards practical application uh, and development of the content read and engaged with prior to arrival. Uh, learning activities and ecology of resources. Um, I'm trying out a few things, um, but just quickly, higher education is consistently viewed communities essential uh, to support collaborative learning and discourse, which is associated with higher levels of learning. And again, I just very timely unit having e everything go online <laughs> to be thinking through some of these things. Um, and so unfortunately, this has sometimes proved difficult in these kind of asynchronous learning environments and online spaces. Um, research though demonstrates communities of practice that seek to have students play a more equal role in resource development and gender powerful spaces for student driven learning. And so I'm certainly finding that in, in uh, already, but also how students battle with it as I've sometimes battled with it myself. Um, and the challenge is how I can try and generate these ecologies of learnings and how I map these onto the various learning outcomes. Um, so the two uh, EOL, resource, EOL resources I, I'm, I'm trying to use are Flipboard, um, uh, particularly for the peer assessment, which is kind of a little bit what we did for this unit, uh, uh, which is re relevant to assessment one. Um, so students required to post 300 words of their chosen topic for research, out outlining why they're interested in it, an emerging question and their thesis and how they'll go about answering it. Uh, and then to post these kind of 100 word responses to their fellow students uh, with the idea of trying to create a community and collaborative learning as well. Um, and so this assessment is designed to address learning outcome two which is kind of competence of research principles and methods, including analytical communication skills applicable to theology and its related disciplines. So the other thing that, that I'll be doing is, is similar to actually what we're doing now. Um, and that's for assessment three, which is a seminar presentation for this unit. Um, so based on that peer assessment um, as well, one of the sessions will be presenting to your fellow peers and getting feedback um, uh, as well uh, before that kind of final project actually is formed and take place. So I'm hoping the peer assessment helps the, the, the flipped uh, approach. And then again, uh, the seminar with kind of peer feed, feedback as well. Um, I'm not sure if I'm talking too quickly or too slow, but we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'll just skip some of those um, learning outcomes there as well. But just to speak briefly as coming uh, to the end is, you know, who are the target learners to toolkits uh, in the community of inquiry uh, environment to facilitate learning. I think I should have started with the demographics that was asked for. So it's not as big as your 2000 classes, Caitlin. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, students range for us between 18 through to 60 in terms of age, uh, often mature age students. Um, student data had shown 2019 that our cohort was roughly 60% female, 40% male. Uh, and there could be between 10 or 15 students present in the class uh, at any given time for this master's capstone. Um, so as mentioned, uh, really what a part of the toolkit is a flip, uh, flip board for peer review assessment. Uh, using Google Collaborative Map uh, has actually been really successful. <laughs> um, just initially as, a, as something that I picked up, uh, Thomas, from yourself. And this, uh, in this group and how many students actually got on and, and found that a really useful thing to do in terms of locating where, where each other is at um, and their peers' location. Uh, one thing I'm 
weighing up, which I haven't actually done yet, was potentially using Mendeley for the sharing of key methodology resources uh, that students will need uh, uh, for their research too. And uh, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Awesome, it looks like it's uh, coming to give a well. Yep. Well, that, that's our last presentation for today. And thank you everyone for a bit of a whirlwind and very long day uh, of, of presentations. Um, I was just wondering before everyone heads off, because everyone's probably pretty knackered now, but uh, uh, the idea of perhaps future versions of presentations, and I'm not, not saying this for assignment three because we're already kind of halfway there, but um, maybe instead of it just being a, a 10 minute open presentation as such, maybe a, around a particular format like a Pecha Kucha. I don't, has anyone done a Pecha Kucha or seen a Pecha Kucha? Yeah, we did one in um, the, the previous subject, yeah, or with an option anyway. In the G-cut? Yeah, in the G-cut. Okay, and how did that go? I think that's one for the kind of the risk modelers, so I think the values are really important questions, probably not one that we have the expertise to answer, but certainly one we can put back to the um, set of... Is that for us? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe it wasn't because it wasn't very loud. Um, yeah, so what was the experience of, of you doing a presentation as Pitch Kucha? I liked it. I'd never come across it before. But it was it was good. Yeah, it, it, it was, was it was quite challenging. We had to do it as a, a group. I was part of that class as well, and and that was an, quite a challenge doing it as a group of people trying to get it into one Pitch Kucha. But yeah. the actual format itself was quite cool but the group stuff was so complex over zoom yeah i, I was kind of thinking of as, as individual pitch coaches so you basically you've got a very tight presentation framework mm. to work to which is 20 slides 20 seconds per slide yeah um rather than just an opening in 10 minutes uh which uh, I think there was four or five pe people managed to sort of keep to today but the uh, majority of people um, their timing was a little bit out, <laughs> which was unfortunate. I had to keep cutting people off. Um, mm. And I was just thinking if we did a pitch coacher and still had a 10 minute time slot per person, that would give a couple of minutes at least for feedback and questions as well. Um, but I, I, you oh, know, I, I think if you ask to uh, provide a video, uh, strictly 10 minutes, so people can still make it yeah yeah I, I still think the live uh for me anyway uh, in this sort of presentation oh, is yeah, a bit more engaging than a preset um video oh. and that was my fault with not turning the audio sharing on for paulus unfortunately um yeah, we, we sorry we previously we did the picture culture it's also uh, recorded by zoom <laughs> right okay rather than a live one mm. Right. I, I like the uh, the uh, performance aspect, so I like it live. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, but anyway, just a thought. So I just wanted to get some quick feedback before everyone headed off. So anyway, have a go at um, checking out each other's presentations, doing your number four blog post and comments. Um, and uh, if you haven't managed to submit your Google Form peer feedback, um, you know, do that over the next few days and I'll probably look at collating the, all those over the weekend. Some homework for me. Um, do we have a, do we have a, um, a session next Monday? To touch I'll back? have a, a Zoom session uh, for whoever wants to turn up and, and, and talk and get ideas cool. and feedback, etc. Great. But no, no, set, um, no set menu. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, everyone. There you go. Have a good rest of your day. We'll catch you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.